Welcome back. In this first video on panel data analysis, I will highlight the benefits of using panel data. I will briefly talk about the idea behind fixed and random effects. Then I move into starter where I show you how to run both models and how to interpret the outcomes. Now, first of all, um, if you remember our discussion right at the beginning of this course, we spoke about different types of data structures. We came across um, the time series and we looked at cross-sectional data in, in the form of surveys, for instance, so we sample a certain number of households at a particular point in time. Panel data combine both, so you have a time dimension and you have a cross-sectional dimension. So for instance, you could consider looking at um, maybe 100 companies over 10 years. And this enables you to simply pool your observations, you, you work with a larger data set, but also it enables you to analyze um, um, differences in different groups and also differences over time. If, if you want to um, quantify the impact of a policy change um, on a particular um, outcome variable, like international trade, for instance, you need to observe countries that undergo the policy change and ones that don't. If you don't have the counterfactual, it becomes impossible to differentiate between a policy change that happens at a certain point in time and other confounding effects that also happen at a certain point in time. The next benefit is even more important. The um, understanding and analysis of causal relationships. Now in this context we talk about Granger causality. Now, Granger causality um, means that um, a predetermined variable or a lagged variable affects the current variable, but not vice versa. Now, put differently, that means the past can affect the present, but the present cannot affect the past. So, put differently, there is nothing like time travel. Yeah. Well, if um, in future it's possible to time travel, come back here and leave a comment below. Otherwise, um, we assume it doesn't exist. Now, in terms of causality, we talk here to be more specific about causal order. Yeah? So we talk about the time difference. That does not always mean there is a true causal relationship. The other element when it comes to policy change is that sometimes it takes time for change to happen. Yeah, so we need to observe um, a certain um, outcome variable over a time period to understand um, the dynamics. Um, sometimes you might even see that a policy change might be anticipated. Now, a panel data model would um, indicate the time dimension, usually denoted with small t, and a cross-sectional dimension, usually denoted with an i or a j. So in this particular example, we have a dependent variable, yit, we have a constant term, um, alpha, and then we have two independent variables and an error term that also reflects um, our um, cross-sectional and time dimension. This model as it stands um, is a, um, a normal regression model. We haven't accounted for the fact that we are dealing with panel data. If you apply um, OLS to panel data, you sometimes also see the name system or panel OLS. But basically it means um, um, we just run this as an OLS model without you know, specifically taking into, into account um, that we actually have panel data. Um, there are, broadly speaking, two different ways of modeling panel data. One is the fixed effects model and one is the random effects model. They, too, make different assumptions about um, how the model fits to your data. In a fixed effects model, each and every cross-sectional unit um, is allowed to deviate from the model in the intercept, but not in, in the so-called slope coefficients. So what you see is if I um, go through um, different cross-sectional units, you might have a shift of 
your regression curves or planes but um, nothing is changing in terms of the actual shape of the planes. In terms of um, the um, underlying calculation, the fixed effects model is nothing else but using dummy variables for your cross-sectional units in an OLS regression. Now, um, the random effects model makes a different assumption. It assumes that there is an additional error term which is specific to a, a cross-sectional unit. So you also have um, a variance. Now, as I mentioned before, the fixed effects model, it, it's quite often in many areas of research um, um, the standard model to use. And very often it's not even really questioned, to be honest. Yeah? So in particular, if you have firm level data, um, you see this an awful lot um, as, as, a, as a standard approach um, to panel data estimation. Now, very often the argument for fixed effects is that um, I cannot observe some cross-sectional specific um, variables perfectly, so anything unobserved is captured in the fixed effects. So, for instance, in the context of um, firm level data, many people might argue that management skills or experience of the top management um, is difficult to quantify. Hence, using fixed effects would capture these particular differences. And of course, here you make the assumption that these differences persist over time. Now, in the case of random effects, the assumption is different. You assume there is um, an additional um, error term, UI, and so there is um, a cross-sectional specific error component. Now, this basically means that um, the model you try to fit um, might not be the perfect model for all these cross-sectional units. You have a unit-specific deviation from that model. Now let's move into a starter. I opened a new do file and I already um, changed the directory um, into the right folder where I keep the UK panel data. Again, the UK panel data set is available on GitHub. The do file, of course, is also on GitHub. So I started with a use um, dataset command. I use the clear option. So um, if I just run this, it should simply open my data set. You can do a little browse of the data. It covers a whole set of financial data. Now let's um, have a quick look at the description. So um, these are the different labels. We want to focus on profitability. We use, um, for instance, return on assets uh, as a starting point, and, and then we build up our model. There's only one thing I would like to add, uh, and this is um, firm um, size, because it's not yet defined in the data set, if I can type it. I just call this size, and firm size um, is usually defined in the literature as the LN um, of total asset. So that gives me a measure of firm size. I use um, the LN transformation um, simply to um, account for the fact that you have diminishing returns in, in terms of you know size benefits. So now I run some um, panel regressions. I start with um, a box standard OLS regression and just um, use that as a starting point, which would be my panel OLS or system OLS. I threw in research and development relative to total assets, um, working capital relative to total assets, interest coverage and financial leverage. Again, I don't want to really go into the um, reasons for that and you know the accounting details. Let me just run this and check whether I spelled all these things correctly. Um, yeah, it runs through. So um, this is um, our normal OLS regression. So we know how to interpret um, the outcome. If you forgot, uh, there is the video on regression analysis. So that um, looks promising. You have a positive size effect. This is what you would expect. Um, we now have to tell um, starter that code year is my my panel data dimension. Um, I would put this above the regression models. So basically here we, we tell starter that we work with panel data. So how do we tell? We use T-set. 
code here. So once we told that, let me just run this and you see it in a minute. Um, now start, I would take um, as a panel variable, which is the cross section variable, the code, which is um, our company code. It shows it's unbalanced. That literally means that I don't have for all the companies all the years um, observed, which is fine, but is something to consider. And then I have a time variable. Um, there might be some gaps in the data. Yeah, so you have, of course, an issue around missing um, variables. And we spoke about this um, in, in, previous, um, in previous lectures. Good, now let's run a fixed effects model. I just take that, put an XT in front, and then use the FE option. And we can do the same for the random effects. I just put RE in the options and I run it. Now let me just run um, the fixed effects model and see what happens. And that would be our fixed effects model. Now compared to our standard regression, it looks a bit different. First of all, you will notice here that the R squared is split into three different R squared. Now what does that mean? So the within R squared would basically tell me how good is my model fit, or put differently, how much of the observed variability of profitability can I observe within my cross-sectional unit. And the answer is about 18%. Between is um, basically comparing between different firms. And here it goes down to about 14%. And the overall effect is around 14%. Um, then you see further below some additional information. Yeah, the, the sigma u is your um, main um, is the main error term in your in your model. U in this case would be for the, the unit you see denoted here ui, which is the dominant error term. So here about almost. Um, yeah, 79% um, of the variance is because of cross-sectional units, so to speak. Yeah, And the sigma e would be um, the standard deviation for the um, epsilon it um, error term. So that basically tells you right away that um, the, the, the cross-sectional dimension is um, certainly an important one. And then below you see the F-test for um, all these um, actually dummy variables. Yeah? So you have many dummy variables because we have um, 987 groups. So you do a joint hypothesis test whether all these um, um, coefficients are jointly equal to zero. Or put differently, this um, um, firm-specific error term is equal to zero. And you can um, clearly reject that. Yeah, so this would be an indication that um, the fixed effects are um, quite um, a valid um, assumption. Then we run um, the random effects. Um, and um, here we um, also obtain uh, uh, the fractions for the individual error term. It's slightly less than before. We later, in another video, will compare the two um, using the Hausmann test and also have a discussion which model would be most appropriate for our setting. Good. The final thing I want to do is very quickly, I want to now um, suppress the output. So I use the quiet option, put this around and um, do some indentation here. I don't really have to, but it looks better. And I do an estimate store A and I do an estimate store B. And here we have the estimate store C. So we might also add some statistics in here. I just um, threw in the um, observations because the um, R squared is not so easy to compare in this particular case. I just want to compare mostly the coefficients and see what happens to our significance tests. And if I run this, um, you see that um, for some of these variables, there is no massive difference. However, for instance, for the firm size um, variable, there is quite a strong difference between the, the specifications. So in this case, it would definitely matter which one would be our preferred option.
Good, that's all for this session. I see you in the next one.